Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on where you are in the world. This is Gloria White coming to you with Annie. <laughs> she's gotten a new ball and she brings it to her mama. Every time I start reading the Bible, she brings it to me. Um, I guess because she can't see anybody that I'm talking to. So she thinks I must be talking to her. <laughs> she's so cute the way she does that. So the whole time I'm reading to you, I could just be going like this. So if you see that, that you'll know what, what's happening there. Okay, today I am in Mark, the book of Mark in the New Testament in the King James Version of the Holy Bible, chapter 10. And he arose from thence, this is Jesus, and cometh into the coast or the regions of Judea by the father's side, farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him, are gathered unto him uh, again. And as he was wont or custom, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife or to uh, divorce her? And they were tempting him or testing him. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered, uh, suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away or um, permit it them at, to put their wives away or dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness, or because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made male and female. For this cause or reason shall a man... Leave his father and mother and cleave or be joined to his wife. And they, twain, or the two of them, shall be one flesh. Yeah. Now, this part here is in all capital letters. So, it says, from the beginning of the creation, God, and then all caps, made them male and female. For this cause or reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. The, that All of that is in all caps. So that's real emphasis. And then, so then they are no more twain but one flesh. They're not, not, not two separate things. They are joined together, and now they are one flesh. What wherefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder or separate. And in the house of his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife, or divorce her, or um and marry another, committeth adultery against her. Against her. Against the woman that he marries. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be, and be married to another, she committeth adultery. So, let me read verse 11 again. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall be put away from her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. I want to say something here. There's only one unforgivable sin. Something that you can't come back from. And that is, if you deny God, 
if you deny his Holy Spirit to come into you. If you deny God, if you say like he doesn't exist, if you deny him to come into your life, then you are denying God. When you go before the court of Satan, when you're drugged there in front of Satan's court, because you haven't fallen down and worshiped Satan. When you do that, the Bible says, take no thought about what you're going to say. Jesus said, don't think about a word that you're going to say. For in that hour, the words will be given to you and they you will allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. If you don't allow that, then you are denying God, you are denying the Holy Spirit, and it's an unforgivable sin. There's nothing else that's unforgivable. That's it. And you can Google that and check it out yourself. The unforgivable sin. Denying the Holy Spirit. Okay. All right, let's see. So, and they brought young children to him, and he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer, or allow the little children to come unto me, for I, I forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, innocent, he shall not enter therein. Little children believe things. They're innocent. Um, so, that's what we want to be. We want to be innocent and we want to believe. And he took them up in his arms. He, he put his hands upon them and blessed them. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit in eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why thou callest me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. And kill is not the same thing as murder in in. The word kill means murder in the commandment. Thou shalt not kill means thou shalt not murder. Okay, murder is when you lie in wait, you know, to get somebody to kill them. Um, that is murder. That is the, that is the definition of murder. In the commandment, thou shalt not kill. That doesn't mean you shouldn't defend yourself or your family. If someone means you physical harm, you say, well, but Jesus said to turn the other cheek. Yes, he did. And he meant that if you were being persecuted for him or the word's sake, Turn the other cheek. You know, when they slapped Jesus, they struck him. He didn't strike back. He turned the other cheek. He did not defend himself when he was being persecuted. But what did he tell the disciples to do before he was crucified? He told them, to sell one of their robes and buy a sword. Now, what would they need with a sword? 
to hold people at sword point, to make them or force them to become believers, that won't work. You know that it has to be a personal choice. People have to choose. So why would they need a sword? Why would he tell them to sell one of their robes and buy a sword? For self-protection against someone who would try to kill you so that you could defend yourself. Just like when Jesus said, the strong man, had he known in what hour the thief would come, he would have been ready and waiting and would not have allowed the thief to plunder or break up his house. Well, that also, that analogy there, that parable, is the strong man if he is us waiting for the return of Christ. And we don't know when he's coming back, so we should be ready. But it also emphasizes that this strong man was allowed to defend himself. So, um, Christ does not intend for us to just be m murdered or killed unless we're being cru uh, crucified for him or for the gospel. There's a difference. So if you have, say, with what we're going through now, if you have some people come to your door and kick your door in and they're intent on burning down your house or harming your family or yourself, you should defend yourself in whatever way that you can defend yourself against what's happening. So don't just stand there and let them just knock you down rape your children and your wife, um, you know, torture you or set your house on fire, tie you up and leave you there to burn to death. Defend yourself. It is perfectly normal. It is allowed by Christ for you to defend yourself. Sell one of your robes and buy a sword. Now, if there had been guns... Available then, he would have said, hawk your coat or sell your coat and get a gun. It's the same thing. It's a weapon to use to defend your life. So, that being said, let us move on. So, and he also said, do not steal. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. Do not bear false witness. Don't go and say that someone did something that they didn't do or that you saw something and you didn't or say that something happened that didn't. So default not, defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, what does that mean? Honor thy father and mother. And why should you do that? How do you do that? You take care of them in their old age. You don't um, ignore them. You don't um, just go on like you don't care what happens to them when they wind up old and needing food or medicine or something, if you're able, you should be helping them. Um, also, you shouldn't be cursing them. And by doing that, God will give you long life. It's, prom it's a promise in this book. So now, verse 20. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Now this is the guy that's asking, what do I have to do to get into heaven? And so after Jesus says these things to him, and he, and he says, And he answered and said unto him, 
Master, all these things have I observed are done from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. You know the saying, it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than to get into heaven? When you're loving your money and you walk by someone who's hungry and you don't help them, but you have a ton of money, but chances are you're going to have the door slammed in your face. And, and if you see someone in the wintertime without a coat and you have a ton of money and you don't get that person a coat, it doesn't matter if you get it from Goodwill doesn't matter if you give them $20 for them to go to Goodwill and get a coat. You should provide for their need. And this is, this is why it's hard for a, 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 it would be, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it would be to get into heaven. And the eye of a needle, once again, is in the wall that surrounds the city in these days. <clears throat> excuse me, there at their dark, they would close the main gates. Now, you could still get into the city, but you couldn't take your camels in with you because there was just one door the size that just one man could fit through at a time. And so there's no way that a camel could pass through the hole that a man can pass through because they're so much larger. So... It would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle, which is the little tiny door in the wall, than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. That doesn't mean rich people don't go to heaven. It means people that don't care for the, you know, Christ is always saying, care for the poor and the widows. So it's like that, okay? And when you see your brother in need, to help them. So um, these are the things that are Christ-like. So we want to be like Christ. Oh, sorry, my puppy's uh, insisting I throw the ball and she's bumping everything here. So let's see. Now, the other thing I want to point out is, is this is Mark 10, verse uh, 21. And he's telling him to take up the cross. Now this is before Christ is crucified. So why is he telling him to take up his cross? What does that mean? If you take up your cross. Take up the cross. Be willing to be sacrificed or die for Christ or the gospel. Just like the apostles were crucified or um, killed for the gospel. They never denied Christ. They, 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 they would not betray Christ by turning their back and just saying, Oh yeah, he doesn't exist. Don't kill my body. Um, they knew from what Christ taught them. That if they save their life, they lose it. If you lose your life, you save it. So you wonder, like, now what does that mean? Okay, you have a mortal body and you have a spiritual body. And the spiritual body, your soul, is within this fleshly body. Okay? Our flesh bodies are like a shell. So now... What we are interested in saving is our soul because that's what will go into heaven or, or, or in the afterlife with Christ and God um, is our soul. So that's what we want to preserve. 
So if we save our life, we lose it. So if we save our mortal bodies by um, denying Christ, then we will lose our eternal life. But if we lose our mortal life, no, yeah, if you, if you save your mortal life, you lose your eternal life. If you lose your mortal life, you save your eternal life. So that's what that means. Um, if you save your life, you lose it. If you lose your life, you save it. So losing your earthly life for Christ, you preserve your eternal body, which is your spiritual body or your soul. So, um, all right, uh, let's see. So, he, even here, Christ is saying, take up your cross to this young man and follow me. At verse 22, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly, or how hard it is for they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. So how hard it is for those. Because they can't, they don't want to turn away from the earthly things and devote their lives to the heavenly things doesn't mean you shouldn't have a house or, or a piece of land or that you should have furniture or that you should have a jewelry it doesn't mean you shouldn't have any of those things remember the saying the love of money that you can't serve two masters you will love the one and hate the other, or hate the other, love the one and hate the other. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So, that's what it, it's, it's saying, is that it's the love of money that's evil. Money isn't evil. Um, uh, otherwise, God wouldn't bless us, you know, with, with money that we can get the things that we need, or provide for us. Things that have value are, are uh, in this world. If, if it were that only Christians who had nothing in this world could get to heaven, boy, I tell you, there'd be a lot of room to roam around up there because not many people would get in. But it's the love of money, the love of money that will keep you from heaven's doors. Heaven's gates from entering in. Okay. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again, saying unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches, trust in riches, to enter into the kingdom of God. Who are we supposed to trust? Who do we trust in? Who do we put our trust in? Into God, into Jesus Christ. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished, out of measure or beyond measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And when Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. So you're not getting into heaven without him. It's impossible. <laughs> Verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, 
Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said unto them, and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left, left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. So what did he say about serving that the one that thought he would be first would be last and would serve all. So, remember when Jesus washed the disciples, the apostles' feet? And Peter's like, Ah, oh, no, Lord, you're not washing my feet. Get up from there. And Jesus said, But, you know, I can't help you if you don't allow me to do this, to be a servant to you. And Peter said, well, not just my feet then, Lord, my head and my whole body. Um, because, you know, if that's what it's going to take, Lord, then, you know, don't just wash my feet. Wash my head, too. And they were in the way, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took them again, the twelve. And began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. Now what is this scourge? Like you hear the scourge of the earth, right? But there's also a thing in, in the, during this time frame that the Romans had that was called a scourge. And it has a handle that's wrapped with leather. And the strings of the leather come out into little strips. And they're, they're on those, those pieces of um, string leather threads that are coming out. Um, there are little metal balls that are all barbed. They're not smooth and round. They're sharp. And um, tear the flesh when, when they strike them with it. And... Um, so there's knots that keep those um, in place down these lead pieces of leather. And then there's a knot tied in the ends. But um, that is a scourge. And that's what they beat our Lord with. So this what they have done to Christ is why you put on your Christian armor so that you can stand for him in that day or whatever day that they persecute you it for him. Be Christ like. And he's telling you the same things that are befalling him here will befall you in the end days. And James and John and the sons of Zebedee come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Now they're asking for a favor.
and he says, What would ye that I should do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And they said unto, um, unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. That's pretty pumped up, don't you think? Puffed up. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what you ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said, said unto them, Yea, shall ye indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized withal shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand or my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given unto them for whom it is prepared. Now we know that Christ, is when he ascended into heaven, he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, right? So, and when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John because they would say such a thing. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, You know that which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles or um, who um, considered rulers over the Gentiles? Exercise lordship over them, or lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you, or desires to be great among you, shall be your minister or your servant. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest or desires to be first shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, this is verse 45, and it is a prophecy unfulfilled because he hasn't been crucified yet for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto he didn't come to be ministered unto he came to minister to those and what does it mean to minister to care for those that have need of of the um salvation of healing to get the demons in this earth out of them to cure them of their afflictions, to serve the other people that have need. You know, remember Dorca that died and Christ came and he rose her up? That she spent so much time sewing coats for those in need. She, she was ministering unto those less fortunate than herself. And see, if the rich man isn't caring for those less fortunate than himself, it'd be harder for him, for a camel, to go through the eye of a needle than to get into heaven. So minister one to another. Care for your fellow man. Look after them. Help them in their time of need. If they ask you to go a mile, go two miles. If they ask you for your coat, give them both. Remember Christ said that? Well, if you don't remember, just keep listening and we'll get to that part. I know some of you haven't been through your Bibles, but and I know a lot of times I say things that maybe I haven't covered yet, and it's but it's scripture that I've already read um, that's relevant to this particular issue that's going on. So, but so shall it be. So, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever 
will be the great among you, shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, shall be the servant of all. So if you're not serving uh, others, you're going to be last. And you're going to be serving others in the life hereafter is, is what I get from this. And what the, the most important thing that I get from this is that Jesus came to serve. He didn't come to be served. So in being Christ-like, we should serve, especially the widows and the orphans, the elderly women who have lost their husbands, and children without fathers. There's a lot of single moms out there that could really use a hand. Do you know one in your neighborhood that you could drop a $20 bill in her mailbox and might just, you know, make her day? Or, you know... Um, put a, a gift card in her door or take a bag of clothes that you got from someone that you knew that, you know, looks about the size of her kids. You know, you know who the people are that are in need in your neighborhood if you're paying any kind of attention. You've seen them going and coming. Some of them don't even have a car. They're on the bus or, or they're, they're just walking. And you see them coming home with bags of groceries, carrying them, even the little kids with a bag, you know, um, because they've got their food stamps and they went and got some food. And you don't look at that and say, oh, well, look at all the food they bought. Don't do that. Don't do that. And I and I hear people say, and I'm going to say this now, but I hear people say, well, I saw somebody down at the food bank in a Cadillac. Hmm. So they bought a Cadillac and then they fell on hard times. How dare they? And then to show up, the nerve of them, to show up at the food bank in that Cadillac. Hmm? Really, think about that. Is that the right way to think about someone that's at a food bank? Sure. There are people that just use the food banks. They're cheapskates. But really, 99.9% .9 of them that are there need help. They are in need of help. Okay? So, when you see somebody show up, show up at, even in a Hummer, you know, you're like, well, why don't they sell that thing? Well, maybe they just got it three months ago when they had a great job and they had been on that job for over a year and thought, you know, honey, I've always wanted that Hummer. And she goes, you know what? You're doing really good. You know, this is, this is, I think we can do it. You know, let's check out and see what the, you know, the, the payment's going to be and how much the insurance is. And she says to him, you know, I really want you to do this. You know, you deserve it. You work so hard. You, I want you to go ahead and get your Hummer. So they go down to the lot and they buy a Hummer. Then five months or six months later, they get laid off. They owe more on that Hummer than it, they could sell it for. They're pretty much saddled with it. And the only thing that can happen is they get another job where they can continue paying for it or it'll be repossessed. But you don't know when you look at someone what their situation is. And just like I talked to you about compassion, about someone being angry or upset, and, and you see them and you're like, what's, what's up with them? Yeah. Yeah. You should ask yourself, what is up with them? You know, and and they come in, the, they're in your face, or they're giving the cashier at the store a hard time, or they're yelling at their kids. What you should ask yourself is, what's going on here? Well, why is this person so upset? 
Maybe you've seen them before. Maybe they're your neighbor. And you've never seen them act like that before. Maybe you don't know them from Adam. But you see them. And if you really can look at people and look past at what they're wearing or how their hair is or what kind of jewelry they have on or what kind of car they're driving and try to see the person that's there, the spirit that is in that body, what is it going through? What is happening to it? Why is it angry? Why is this person upset? And try to have compassion and put yourself in their situation. Have you ever been like that? Have you ever just lost your temper? Have you ever just gone off on somebody? Even I've done that. And then you want to kick yourself later. But, you know, at the time you're just like so stressed out. And, and just the smallest thing is just like. The camel that broke, the straw that broke the camel's back and you just crack. You know, a lot of people are under so much pressure that, you know, it's so important for us to be considerate of other people and to have compassion. So when you're ready to like lash out at somebody and say, you know, dude, what the heck is the matter with you? What? No, don't do it that way. Stop yourself. Think about it for a minute. Give yourself 30 seconds to process what's happening. And think about, if you're standing in their shoes, what's happening. Like that. Think about them like if they were you. What would you want someone or need someone to say to you? You know? Oh, do, do you need help with that? Do you, do you have enough money to pay for that? Or... Is there something I can help you with? You know, if they're they're checking out and maybe they're going to start having to put things back. Maybe it's like they they needed this food, but doggone it, they're not going to be able to pay the rent. Well, what are we going to do? You know, maybe they're stressed out about that. You don't know what people are stressed out about. You don't know why someone's lost their temper or their cool. You know, um... And, and you know, if you pay attention, and I'm an empath, I mean, I've always been like that. I can always sense people. I can sense other people. I can sense them from like 50 feet away. If they have a weight on them, if something's bothering them, if they're light and airy, I can sense that about people. So... For so many years, okay, I've lived here like 13 years, and, and for so many years, I smoke, and I have a dog, and so I have to go out to the front of this apartment complex to smoke, and I'd be out there, and I could feel someone coming, and I could turn and look, and you could, if you pay attention you can see this. I, I, don't, I don't know if other people can see it, really. Maybe you can't. Maybe maybe people are just oblivious. Maybe they don't care. Um, maybe they just, you know, are self-absorbed. Whatever. Um, but I could always sense when somebody was coming, and I would turn and look and see them. And then when they would get by me and start passing me, I'd say, Hey, how you doing? Uh, and I'd say, no, really, how are you? And they would stop and they would look at me. I said, what's going on? Because I knew something was going on. I, I could see, I could sense it, I could feel it. And they would come back and we would start talking. And I may spend two hours out there. I may spend 30 minutes. The time was irrelevant. I'm not, I'm not working, so, you know, it's not like I've got to, you know, keep an appointment or something unless I have a doctor's appointment or something like that. Um, but as far as, like, going to the store or cooking dinner or washing my clothes, all that, that, that comes behind what people need. 
And so I would ask them, you know, what's going on? And and they would look at me and they could see in my face that I really wanted to know what was bothering them, what was going on with them, what was happening, that they were distressed. And so they would come back and they would, you know, I'd say, what's going on? And so they, they might start off slow, but, um, and, and I'd say, oh man, you know, or whatever, you know, um, just acknowledge that they're having a problem. And, um, and then they would just start talking and talking and talking. And, and really it didn't matter if I said anything or not, just nod at my head or occasionally went, oh yeah, you know, they just needed someone who cared about them to be listening to them. They, haven't you ever needed someone to talk to? It's amazing. Uh, people get in situations, and I know I'm way off from here, but but people get in situations where they really don't feel comfortable telling someone that they know of what they're going through. Some people don't want to appear weak. They don't, they don't want to have other people know that they're having a problem or that they're experiencing something. Maybe they had an argument with their husband or their wife and they feel really bad about it, but they can't go tell someone else that they had a fight with this person and, and that it was their fault or, you know, whatever happened. But me being a total stranger... They would just unload it all. I mean, there wasn't anything. And, I, and I'm very open. So people can talk to me. They can tell me anything. And, and I let them. Even if they're using curse words. You know, I just let them. I don't interrupt them. I let them go. I let them unload. I take their load off of them. And these people... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm never, I'm, I never cease to be amazed of how much of a difference it made for these people to just listen to them, to just let them unload everything that was on their mind, anything that was bothering them, whatever happened, whatever struggles they were dealing with, you know, and, you know, they would leave and they were light as feathers. They had unloaded. I could see it in the way they walked in the relief, the the relief in their faces. The tension had just completely drained away from them. It was gone. I had absorbed it all. And it made such a difference. Maybe I would see that person again. Maybe I would never see them again. But if I did see those people again, they were always like, hey, and very happy to see me. Sincerely happy to see me. You know, some people walk by, hey, how you doing? You know, and keep walking. These people, when they saw me, they recognized that I was a person that had cared about them. That I listened to them when they needed help. And they didn't feel embarrassed. They just felt love because that's what I was giving them. Love. Listening to them. Hearing them. Letting them unload on me. And it makes such a difference. And today, people need that more than ever. And, and I know one of my followers, Marla, she's an empath. So she would know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, um, how you feel, you can actually feel how other people are feeling. Now, everybody may not have that. I don't know, maybe, maybe everybody does and nobody, you know, does anything with it. I don't know, um, but I just know how I am. But after a very long time, I got burned out, and it was starting to affect me. 
It was more than I could carry. And so I asked God to give me something else to do. And he did. But when you're open to God, he will use you in the most amazing ways to do his will to help your fellow man. And, and that's all I'm going to say about that because I've gotten way, way off course. But anyway, you know me. Sometimes I go there. <laughs> Did she just go there? Yeah, she just went there. Okay, now I'm back. <laughs> all right. So let's see. Okay. So verse 44. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest or... Um, who will desires to be first shall be the servant of all for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many and when they came to Jericho and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number or a great multitude of people blind Bartimaeus the son of Timaeus sat by the highway or the roadside begging and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth he began to cry out and say Jesus thou son of David have mercy on me and many charged him or warned him that he should hold his peace or keep silent. But he cried the more of a great deal. So he cried out all the more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called, or, you know, have him brought to him. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good comfort or cheer. Rise, he calleth thee. And he rose, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. So his, his outer robe, he just, you know, threw it down. He's like, hey, I'm there. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and saith unto him, What wilt thou? that I should do unto thee. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now, would you, would you, do you think about when the Lord would say to you, what do you need? <laughs> You're like, huh, what do I need? Let me think. Let me prioritize. Okay. First, salvation. <laughs> Always number one. You know, um, and once you have him, if, you know, you're sick or your family's sick and you're praying to him and asking him, you know, um, just do it. Down in nothing. Ask him. Doubting nothing. And uh, he will hear and he will pray to the Father. Okay, so that's the end of chapter 10 in my rant. I'm sorry, we're almost at an hour. But I hope you've gotten something from this. And as always, you know, I love you.